following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. It's time for Volatility Views, the premier radio program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll dive into the world of volatility, how to manage it, profitable strategies, and how to avoid the pitfalls of trading volatility. If it involves volatility, you'll find it on Volatility Views. And now, the Volatility Exchange is proud to present your hosts, Mark Longo and Don Schlesinger. Welcome back to Volatility Views, and I hope all of our listeners out there had a fun and a profitable trading week. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as many of the shows right here on the good old Options Insider Radio Network, and I am joined here on the program, as always, by my boon companion, indeed the yin to my yang, good old Don Schlesinger from the Volatility Exchange. Don, welcome back to the program. Hardly seems like we left. Re, uh, listeners may know that we taped a little bit late for our previous episode on Monday of this week, and here we are Friday, so... Uh, Good to be back, even if it's been only a, a short interval. <laughs> yeah, Don, we have to stop meeting like this. That's right. You know, our listeners may think it's a weak interval between sessions, but we've cranked out two this week, so it's a, a volatility-heavy week. For... Well, just for that, I'm going to skip next Friday and pass it over <laughs> to my colleague, Bob Kraus, who is the, the chairman and CEO of the Volatility Exchange, and he's going to be out at the Traders Expo in Las Vegas, and I think... Uh, he and Mark Sebastian might actually get together and do our next episode from out there. <clears throat> yeah, Don, you and I get a week off while well, those two get to uh, take the reins. A little bit of a scary prospect. I have no idea what they're going to bring to I'll us. Hope but there's uh, still a franchise when the week <laughs> is over. Mark is, uh, is threatening slash promising to also maybe do some man-on-the-street conversations with people at the expo about volatility. So. I'm both intrigued and alarmed by that prospect, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see, not, not so much from the man on the street side, but the fact that Mark will be running it. So we'll see, we'll see what he digs up over there in, uh, in, in Las Vegas land. But of course, Mark will be joining us a little bit later, and right now it's time to dive right into our volatility review. It's time for the volatility review. All right, and welcome to the Volatility Review. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we discuss what's been going on, what action we've seen in the world of volatility over the past week. And this week, I think we're going to mix it up a little bit. We always do the uh, the general vol first, and we get more specific into the products. Maybe we'll mix it up a little bit this week, and there is a lot going on in the land of the Euro, so maybe we'll kick things off with the Euro this week, Don. Don, are you ready for that seismic change in the show? Can you handle that shift? Uh, I think I can handle it. You think you can handle it. All right, Don. So what did we see in the land of Euro and Eurovol over the past week? What particularly caught your eye? Well, we saw a ton of uh, volatility as uh, measured by the, the realized close to close. You know, we're only four days into the new front month of December for the one vol and the three vol, which is... Uh, uh, October, November, December is still uh, running its course. It's uh, into its seventh week of a total that will will be uh, uh, some nine weeks in length. And uh, what we see there, or or uh, 64 trading days, is actually more like you know the full three months. And what we we're seeing are some really very high levels. The four first days in the partial volatility for this new December contract have logged just over 18 uh, volatility. And that's really extremely 
high. Uh, I don't want to give away too much for what's coming, but we have a question towards the end of the show regarding volatility cones and the mailbag and what they show for this kind of volatility. And, you know, the answer is that we are uh, close to uh, unprecedented levels. So uh, it was uh, an active week, not only in the equities markets, but surely in the euro and currency markets as well. Yeah, our little friends over there in Greece and now Italy certainly lended some uh, some excitement to that party over the past week. And uh, it's tough to say that it's over. We've got a very volatile day again today in the, in the equities markets, again fueled by some of the news coming from uh, Europe, which is where everybody seems to look first thing in the morning to take its prompt as to how we're going to be trading and again not only in the equity markets but surely in the euro currency as well and listeners we are joined now by mr seabass aka the greasy meatball aka mark sebastian from option pit our option or our volatility pit reporter as it were mr sebastian welcome to the program sir hey sorry i was a little late Uh, i got tied up uh Tied up in traffic. Hopefully, so I was going to say, hopefully that's not a literal, you were not literally hey, tied up. You never know hey, with depend, you. Depends on what you think. That could be a good thing. <laughs> so, Mr. Sebastian, of course, we just did, we, we mixed up the show a little bit this week. We went a little crazy, and we started off with the Eurovol first. I, I, I threw Don for a loop. He was a little shocked that we did that first. So, I know that's a little crazy, but uh, isn't that's, that's a little crazy, I think. But you've been watching the Eurovol as well, I, I believe. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We were, um, you know, every week, I, all my, the guys in my professional group, which is all guys managing kind of large amounts of money and hedge fund managers and money managers. So I consider them kind of my, 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 uh, my circle of knowledge in a lot of ways. We were all sitting around debating whether this is the, whether Europe is winding down, whether it was ramping up or whether it was something else. And There were kind of two consensus thoughts. One was that it was absolutely ramping up and that things were about to go completely kablooey. Or, and this was kind of where I was coming from, my camp, was that we might be in, uh, have Italy on the same path as Greece. You know, it it seems, at least in the near term, that they've they've taken care of Greece for a while. All right. They, they, everybody's taken a 50% haircut. Greece is laying in the austerity measures and overall and actually trying to collect taxes. Uh, so that seems to be fixed. Italy, I think we may see kind of the same thing where it's, well, they solve everything for nine months. Then they solve everything for three months. And then all of a sudden, every, that's when everything, every crisis hits. So, you know, I think that the euro, the next, you know, yes, volatility is very mean reverting, but it goes through pockets, and I'm sure Don can, can tell you where, you know, mean reversion doesn't mean it has to mean revert over a month or two months. I think, you know, it, in 2008 and 2009, we saw, well, not 2008, in 2009, we saw a lower than expected volatility in euro. And in two, for the rest of 2011 and probably 2012, I would plan on a, a, a general, you know, uptick in the currency volatility and now especially if we start seeing people leaving the euro don here's an interesting question for you what does that do to the mean reversion effect if we start seeing a a, if we see a fundamental change in in the structure of the euro you know one of the interesting things is that volatility is mean reverting unless there is a structural change isn't that well i I think i think that's true and you know even even in today's uh uh, markets and, and the equity markets as well. People are talking about, uh, we'll, we'll see if it's true or not, but you know, people are talking about just like a, a kind of a paradigm shift in, in what we call normal volatility. I, I sat on a trading desk where you, know, you looked at 100 years worth of data and the average volatility of the S&P was 16%. Well, you know, we haven't seen that as, as an average in a couple of years now, and I dare say if you ask most people what they consider to be average volatility for the S&P, uh, they're, they're at a very different level right now, and it, it's difficult to say whether or not that's something that's going to persist. I've 
heard some arguments recently about some of the structured products like the double and triple uh, ETFs and the fact that uh, people are trying to exacerbate the movement in the last half an hour in order to get a little bit more bang out of that. So whether some of this auto, this volatility is artificial or is actually fundamental I think I'll have to play out and remain to be seen. But, you know, your point about the currency is the same type of thing. If there's a fundamental difference in the structure, then you just might have to say that uh, everything that we've got in the past and all of the historical data might simply all just translate or shift to a different level where we have to assume that what we used to think of as average isn't just going to hold anymore. Yeah, those levered ETFs, and uh, I've heard that same, uh, I guess you can call it quote-unquote conspiracy theory, but there might be some some meat to those bones. After all, we have seen increasing levels of volatility around the open and close in the last few years, and we have even in years previous to that, So, and there's been a lot of speculation as to what exactly that cause may be, and it could very well be the people looking for a little bit of extra bang for that levered ETF buck. I know they're, they're a very popular boogeyman right now, those levered ETFs, so why, why not pile on the blame for the, uh, the beginning and end of day volatility to them as well? And of course, Mark made the point that um, we, we have discussed in the past, and it's, uh, it's a very important one that, that listeners understand. Uh, yes, the concept of mean reversion applies to volatility, but so does that seemingly contradictory notion of uh, clustering or persistence in volatility. And we've tried to explain those two concepts, and mean reversion means that Eventually, over a period of time, volatility tends to revert to its mean or average value, but it doesn't ever owe you that on the spot or, you know, within your time frame. And very often when you get a certain regime of volatility, as we have uh, seemingly now in the euro, which is surely higher than average, that can persist and stick around for a while. Whether it sticks around, you know, for months will remain to be seen, but nobody should be surprised if it's sticks around for, you know, several weeks or for a month or more. I know, Don, you're teasing our uh, our listener question here and what we're going to talk about. That's in, called foreshadowing. Yeah, exactly. Not, well, yeah, well, you know, Don, I, I love the clustering, but, uh, you know, that, that, I believe that, Mark, stop me if I'm wrong, but isn't that where the term cluster stop. F came from? Yes, that is exactly where it came from. It came from Don. Don, back yeah. in the 80s, I believe, coined it on the on the Morgan Stanley desk. <laughs> yep. Yep. Don is known Absolute. for for uh, being a pioneer in the land of epithets and curses. <laughs> we try to restrain him here on this show. But of course, we mentioned earlier about what's going on in the broad equity and broad equity volatility. And we should just let our listeners know, as we are recording this here around midday central time, the indices are all looking into the green with uh, the S&P up about 2%, the Dow and NASDAQ all following suit up about 2%, and the good old VIX cash suffering from the weekend effect and the uh, the, the double effect of the rally in the underlying down about 8% or almost three handles to about 30 even. And Mr. Sebastian, I know yesterday on the option block, we talked a bit about how despite what we've seen in the past with people being degenerate premium sellers in that downside SPX skew, there actually are net unit buyers now, at least for the last couple of sessions. Have you seen that trend continue into today's yeah, session so absolutely. far? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing is, is that from you know the market opened up about 19 handles at about 1258 or so 12 50, you know about 17 18 handles at about 1258 and the vix was at 2970 so and Don, Don, you'll like this what does this tell you okay from 945 the the spx rallied from 1258 to 1265 from 945 to about 1015 during that period, the VIX rallied from 29.70 to about 30, 30.3, 30.4. Uh, Don, what do you, what do you interpret from from that rally in SPX and VIX simultaneously? It's kind of un, it's kind of unusual, and uh, you know, especially when you take into account the fact that there is the the weekend effect that you have as well. Sometimes people overshoot the mark a little bit and uh, sometimes people take a look at that kind of opening and uh, say I don't I don't think it's going to sustain I don't 
think that uh, it'll actually hold. So in the event that you might see some sort of a retracement, it might have shown up uh, at least temporarily in the uh, options premiums. But, mm -hmm. you know, of course, uh, you you have the fact that we talk about often negative uh, correlation and surely the, the market was up and VIX was down. But, you know, it, it, it's never a guarantee. It's never an absolute promise that they won't move in tandem. And you just quoted a little short period there where both the market and VIX uh, went slightly higher. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an actual rise in volatility. I mean, how, I mean that is a, it, you know, if you see the rally half a point on a, a half a percent rally, I mean, that's a true increase in volatility over that period of time. I, my personal feeling, and this is a directional bet, okay, if you buy a put on the close of business today, you are not be unhappy. I, the last, and you know, basically, it tells me that the last ten points of this rally, the market's basically denying it, um, and in fact, there, the market thinks it's going to fade. So, just kind of, that's kind of my personal. That's me as a trader talking, not as an analyst. Uh, that's what I see when I see something like that. And people forget too when these minute swings in the S and P and the VIX, and they they expect these these types of strong and pure correlations. They forget the fact that VIX is a product, and it's also it's also derived from paper flow in that product. And we could have seen you know strong customer buying into that rally on net units, like we've been talking about before, and that of course would would juice the VIX as well. So there's a lot of components that Probably go into what's that. Probably what's happening. Yeah, exactly. You, I mean, you know, it's funny, Mark, but I, I I was thinking the exact same thing as as Mark was talking about, you know, buying puts on the close or whatever. And this is, you know, I don't I don't want to get into my VIX bashing mood uh, again or mode, but you know, this this is uh, the the problem and, and and it's not subjectively that I'm speaking, I'm speaking objectively. Uh, it, it is a product and you know, you could have had somebody look it up 19 handles and say, this is a blow off. This is the greatest thing in the world. We're going to be up 30, 40 handles by the end of the day and go out and buy, you know, tens of thousands of calls and drive up uh, uh, the prices and all of a sudden, you know, the, the offers go through the roof and you look at the implied volatility of the option and you say, wow, look at how that's uh, volatility is gone. Volatility hasn't gone up at all. Market didn't move from that particular point. But if you if you have buyers coming in and all of a sudden the sellers can command higher premiums for their options, hey, go for it. Next thing you know, you're calculating VIX and you're getting a greater number. This is the whole argument and the difference between realized or actual volatility, you know, is the market moving and showing volatility or is this implied, is this uh, derived from options prices, which sometimes indicates volatility, but as both of you pointed out, sometimes indicates something else. You always have to get that little dagger in there for realized vol, don't you, sir? Well, you know, it's not fun if at least once a week we don't say something. But. <laughs> but, of course, you know, that is true. I think a lot of people who are outside observers to the marketplace who haven't, you know, been actively trading on a desk or been down in the pits often underestimate the power and impact of the paper flow on a particular product. And that anyone who's been down there in the midst of this knows that is the real true driver of everything that is going on in a particular product. But outside observers often will uh, will tend to downplay that impact and to look at developments like this and scratch their heads and say, why are they both up a day like today? When in reality, the answer is quite often the, the paper flow and what's actually going on in that particular product. And I think with that... We're going to close out the volatility review for this week and roll right into our volatility viewpoint segment. Now it's time to discuss volatility and volatility trading strategies on Volatility Viewpoint. And welcome to the Volatility Viewpoint. This is where we sit back on the program and we put on our smoking jackets and pick up our brandy snifters and we dive deep into some topic or discussion or debate regarding volatility. And this week's 
conversation actually was kicked off by an article that we found and we're discussing here and I will uh, I will we'll link to it in the show notes so you can find it fully but you can also find it on the futuresmag.com website it was an article in futures magazine and it was titled stock market trends and the volatility premium and it was written by an author named Marco Erling and uh, he is he is uh, he works for HBS I believe I'm not familiar with his work, but uh, this is interesting. HS, HSBC. Uh, HSBC, yes, I'm sorry. Global Asset Management. Yes, and uh, as you may have gleaned from the title there, this this article falls right into our bailiwick here and hits on a lot of points that we've discussed quite a bit in the past. And maybe even before we get to those uh, the, the specific discussion points, I think will be interesting for our audience. Don, do you want to maybe summarize the article briefly for our uh, for our listeners and maybe we'll dive in from there? Sure. The actual uh, premise of the article is that we're all sort of familiar with the concept that uh, there is a risk premium that generally prevails, a spread, if you will, between implied volatility and realized. And we know that for the equity markets over long periods of time, that risk premium on average runs about uh, anywhere from uh, two and a half to four percent with about three and a half or so being the average. But what the author has done is he has broken down uh, periods in the market to times when the index is uh, above its simple 100 day moving average or below its simple 100 day moving average. And he has studied that spread or that time premium of implied with respect to realized and come to some very interesting numerical conclusions about how that spread actually varies under these two different regimes, namely in in an uptrending market and in a downtrending market. And uh, uh, the findings are not necessarily intuitive or what everybody would expect. So we'll have a little fun uh, discussing that a little bit more in depth and analyzing what his findings were. Yes, he breaks it down looking at, uh, I mean, we we like the S&P here, so we'll probably focus on the S&P, but he also looks at Euro stocks and a number of other broad indices here, and he breaks them down in these in this article into looking at the 100 day simple moving average for the S&P and when the S&P is above that 100 day moving average indicating an uptrend and below it indicating a downtrend and be, before I even go any farther let me just say listeners if you're going to read this article you may want to read the whole article first before you go look at that chart on the first page cuz that graphs are usually meant to and visuals are usually meant to uh, to clarify the situation that this that the first charts here are a wee bit obtuse when you first start uh, reading the article but you know, we've discussed many times on the show in the past the fact that volatility tends to favor the downside a wee bit. And whenever we see big, severe downturns in the market, we see corresponding dramatic, overly dramatic upswings in volatility. And yet when we rally to the upside, the uh, the commensurate sell-off in volatility is nowhere near as dramatic. And that, that's a well-documented fact. We've discussed that a number of times on the show in the past. And so when we're looking at this article and we're discussing the concept of the premium of the implied volatility premium versus re- the realized volatility pre- premium, which is also something we've discussed on this show a number of times, and the fact that implied is generally higher over the long term than realized. I think a lot of our listeners would put those two facts together and would just construe that the spike or the differential between implied and realized would be much higher to the downside because that is when we see the big spikes in overall implied volatility. And I think the real interesting takeaway from this article is that if you look at the data points the author has compiled here, he actually found that the even though the overall volatility is less to the upside, the differential between implied and realized was actually significantly higher in those upswing or those bull market periods than it was in the down market periods, which I think was just a, uh, I think will take a lot of our listeners by surprise. Wouldn't you agree, Don? Well, uh, I would agree that it would probably take people by surprise, but it but it makes sense to me, and I'm going to try to explain it. And uh, I, I actually wasn't surprised to see the result. And um, th- this is my interpretation of of what's going on. It comes from the fact, and you know, I've, I've talked about this ad nauseum, that people tend to look at implied volatility as a somewhat of a 
prediction as to where volatility is going. And uh, I'm, I'm not uh, a proponent of that uh, viewpoint. I'm much more a proponent that options traders are not uh, God's gift to mankind. They're not the seers of the world. They don't have better crystal balls than anybody else uh, predicting volatility. And that implied volatility is, in fact, very much reactive. And what you're really seeing here is the fact that in calm markets or in uptrending markets, which tend to climb that proverbial wall of worry and actually go up in somewhat of a more tame fashion than, than markets do when they often drop precipitously on black swan, adverse uh, you know, pieces of news or what have you. There is this very persistent, ongoing risk premium of implied over realized. And it's about 4%. And in the chart that the author shows us, it's about 4% higher than, than what volatility goes on to display going forward when you actually measure the period that the implied is supposedly forecasting. It's 4% higher, a good 30% of all the time that we're in that uptrend with the moving average regime. And draws a bell curve where on each side of the 30%, there are other risk premiums. So we'll be 6% higher than realized about 20% of the time. And we'll be 8% higher than realized about 10% of the time. And going to the other side, we get down to you know a 2% premium about 15% of the time. And finally, you know, being even where there is no premium at all, maybe 10% of the time, and then it drops off very, very quickly. So the times when it inverts in up markets and you actually see implied lower than realized are very, very rare. And when it happens, it happens uh, one or two percent, and that for only three or four percent of all the time that you spend above the moving average. So it's a rather unusual event. Now, what happens when you get to the downside? Well, I'm going to sometimes in mathematics, there's arguments that are called reductio ad absurdum. Take something to its extreme. Take it to an absurd level. We love just, absurdity here on this program, Don. Well, just in order to make a point, okay? So I'm going to go back to the crash of October 87. The crash in October 87, for anybody who happened to have been around or remember it, the period leading up to it was perfectly normal market volatility. S&P volatility around 16 or 18 percent right up until a couple of days before Monday, October the 19th. So if you were doing a trailing uh, historical one month realized volatility calculation of S&P volatility, you found that it was this 16 or 18 that that I just mentioned and implied were, you know, a couple of points higher as they usually were. And then in one day, the S&P dropped 22, 23 percent, the one single day. So, you know, if you do that root mean square calculation and you have 20 days worth of one percent uh, a day volatility and all of a sudden you have one day worth of 23 percent volatility, you square that 23, you get 529 and you add that to the 20 that you got from the one squared for 20 days, and now you've got 549. You divide it by 21 days, and you take the square root. It's a little bit over 5% daily. Well, that annualizes to 81%, and that's realized volatility. That's calculated actual volatility. So in one day, realized went from 16 to 81 well, there's no way in the world that anybody trading options could have foreseen anything like that and implied volatilities in front of that event were their usual 20, uh, 21 percent, whatever. Now, all of a sudden, you've got realized at 81 percent. So it's the realized that leads the way in these events. And now the options traders scramble. And now they say, 
oh, for God's sakes, how are we going to trade options now? You know, 20 percent. That was obviously not the right number. And now it's uh, 80 percent realized. So they say, well, what can we trade the options at? And so all of a sudden the implieds jump. Okay. well, the implieds jump and, you know, you get back to the same scenario where there's a a premium again. But that premium is very difficult to gauge at this particular point. And so it, it, it turns out that, you know, when the equilibrium starts to be restored, you start to have more of a of a matching between where the implieds are and where the realized is because the realized can actually take these very big jumps to the downside and start to dwarf the implied volatilities. Now, you know, for those who want to say that implieds are, are such wonderful predictors, well, where are they when these events happen? And so this is the, the author's thesis And his conclusion is that despite these very big, high, juicy premiums that you might see to the downside, it's really a very dangerous time to be selling volatility in straddles and strangles or, you know, naked uh, option volatility, because you basically are not being rewarded with the same risk premium, the difference between where realized goes on to display as you are in up markets. So now when when you get to the upside, this argument is completely different. You don't you don't have this atmosphere. You have a calmer market, a market that increases gradually. People are uh, probably less worried about any kind of an untoward event. And, and you get what I would call, you know, the more stable type of environment where implieds, in fact, are commanding that premium over realized. Even if the absolute number is lower, the spread is greater. So it's a better environment for selling time premium than it is in the other uh, situation. People have to understand, and and I said this uh, uh, many times when I was on the trading dress I, uh, desk, I'd rather sell 15% implied volatility sometimes than 40 percent implied volatility because when i was trading straddles and strangles these crazy moves the that we see every day now are absolutely impossible to keep delta neutral and to trade the gamma was was just killing you i'd rather sell 15 and then see the market go on to display 11 realize volatility and collect the four points than I would to sell 32 and wonder whether or not realized isn't going to be 42 yeah. when it's all over. You know, and I, that's exactly what the, the author is finding. I think so a lot his, of, oh, go ahead, go ahead, finish it. Yeah, well, his final conclusion is that the average risk premium for implied over realized in uptrending markets is anywhere from, you know, about two and a half to three percent but that when you are below your 100-day moving average, that average premium not only shrinks all the way down in some markets to about a half a percent, but it actually becomes negative, and the S&P is one of them. So his study went from 1998 to this year, 13 years worth of data, and for the 40% of the time that the S&P was below its 100-day moving average during those days of the 11 years, the risk premium of implied, allegedly supposed to be over-realized, wasn't at all. It was actually six-tenths of a percent the other way, where realized well, higher than implied. Don, I, I, I agree with you, and I disagree with you at the same time. Um, you're, echo, you're echoing again, Mark. Oh, yeah. well, that's we, I, I agree with you, and I disagree with you at the same time. And here is my argument as to where the author misses the the boat and probably and most i think most option traders miss the boat i've never seen I, I haven't seen a lot of guys blow up when the vix when they start trading and the vix is at 40 and stays there or drops a little bit or even goes to 45 or 50 i haven't seen a lot of guys blow up when the vix is at 16 and realizes at 11 where everybody blows up and I, I, if somebody finds a way to analyze when this is going to happen, it'd be brilliant. But when everyone blows up is when the, the VIX or volatility implies 
and realized goes from 11 to 50. So yeah, you're getting those nice four, three huge premiums on those up markets. But those are also times where everything happens at once. The the re, uh, right that option markets are reactionary. They're not. I don't think they're predictive at all. If any market is actually predictive, in this this is this is kind of the best I, I've been able to come up with is the insurance product options on insurance products are sometimes I, I find to be more better forward looking than options themselves. So options on VIX are more predictive than VIX. Options on the 30 year I think are more predictive than the 30 year itself, if that makes sense to you. But where every single person that looks at these studies misses is they they never is that transition period is what what kills everybody. It's not the high side, it's not the low side, it's the it's the transition. And nobody seems to analyze that portion and and so yes, you'd much rather sell 14 vol and have realized be 11, but when you're selling 14 vol at some one point in time that 11 is going to go to 80 or going to go to 50, and that is when you blow up. It's not when you're selling 40 vol and realized volatility is 45 or eight or even 60. All right, it's that 11 to 70 that just crush it. That I see more money lost, and that's where we get into Mark unit puts, right? Indeed, and you know he he does. I agree with you that that transition point is the uh, is definitely the inflection point for most people's accounts, where those big movements are what make or break them on any given point. I mean, it's kind of hard, I would think, to to construct a study purely around those points. He tries to hit on that somewhere at the end of his uh, analysis when he mentions that the extreme events. So the the times when the one month realized over the implied the difference was greater than 10 percent, those have he talks about frequency of those and those have a much higher frequency, obviously, to the downside than to the upside. So he gets into that a little bit where you, the the danger or risk of those massive swings that you're talking about, the blowing up from 11 to 70 in the VIX, let's say, have a much higher probability and frequency of happening to the downside than to the upside. So that that kind of that, that kind of factors into his analysis a little. Little bit that when you're it, writing those it, it downside does. it does and in other words uh i i don't disagree with what you've just said mark but as at, at mark sebastian but as as mark longo just said it it seems to be that he finds from his study that these shocks that you're referring to when people blow up in fact tend to take place much more frequently when you're in the below the 100 day moving average regime Let's let's take like a minute or two to read his conclusions. And actually, you know, although I would probably tend to agree with it, I was really summarizing the article as I was speaking about it. Implied volatility, even when low, often is higher when compared to realized volatility. As mentioned, it might seem that options are cheap in a bull market. Investors often do not sell volatility in these low volatility environments, but in the absence of external shocks, the bull markets lead to even lower realized volatility. People would profit from writing options in this case. And the second part is chances of a bad surprise where, say, realized volatility is far higher than previously assumed are much higher if the index trades below the moving average. Volatility clustering describes the observation that large moves in a stock price tend to cluster together. In these cases, it seems that those periods of high volatilities stick together when markets are below the moving average. So, you know, that's that's the gist of the article. And uh, uh, I, I would say that I, you know, in, in the absence of data to the contrary, 
I think that those are probably true statements. And I think the important takeaway for a lot of our listeners out there who fall into the camp that I jokingly refer to as degenerate premium sellers that I think you, Don, are a card-carrying member of. But, <laughs> but, he's their president. Yes, that's true. He is the, he's the <laughs> president, pre- chairman president, president the in chief, uh, maybe emeritus, but uh, still, uh, still president. But yes, a lot of these people obviously are lured to the dark side by those juicy, rich premiums that you do see in those downside market scenarios. That's that's when they're lured into hitting those bids quite frequently. And the takeaway he's talking about here is that the scenarios like that, even though they are t- attractive, are also leading. They have a much higher probability of being exactly what Mark described, those blowout moments when the things just go off the rails and VIX does go from, let's say, 20 to 80 or something crazy like that. So all, often than not, the people who are lured in by those juicy premiums are often bitten by that fact, whereas even though it is somewhat counterintuitive to think that you're better off selling at these lower vol levels, and surely enough, those degenerate premium sellers are very rarely enticed by the gently easing vol that happens to the upside. That Those are the times when, especially if you're looking at implied versus realized, when you probably want to dive in and you'll make a little bit less, but the uh, the security of that trade and the payoff of that trade is much higher. Uh, probability, I should say, of paying off of that trade is much higher. Mr. Sebastian, do you have any conclusions or do you want to lend a dissenting voice? I, 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 I think he's got a point. Um, you know, the, the key, though, if you're going to be if you're going to follow this is that, yeah, you know what? You're you're those close at the money premiums are really juicy, but you have to be a net owner of the teenies. Right. You can't just sit there, especially the retail public and even the institutional public. You have to own the teenies because when those shocks happen, the amount you pay for those, you could buy teenies for years, and all it takes is one major shock, and you've more than paid for yourself. So that would be what I would add. We are indeed dating ourselves by talking about them as teenies. I'm sure there's a quite a, a cadre of our listeners who have no idea what the heck we're talking about. But yes... That's that, kind of sad, isn't it? <laughs> when, Don, when Don, when even Mark and I are dating ourselves, it must make you feel uh, feel uh, pretty pretty bad. But no, but um, yes, but yes, uh, indeed, that those were the guys we always saw blow out most oftenly on the floor. Where of course those quote unquote teeny put sellers, and uh, for our listeners who don't know, those are just the really really far out of the money, pretty much worthless puts. That but we talked about today, we're seeing that activity in the market again right now, where the net unit buyers on the downside puts are coming in because they see that the risk of that explosive differential between realized and implied is starting to hang in the air again and they're starting to worry about that explosive downside move and that upside in volatility so they're picking up net units and that is just good advice for most trading scenarios particularly now when everything is so uncertain and there is so much risk of potential movement and explosion of volatility you definitely want to be at least uh, a net unit owner I would think anyway. Don, you may disagree because you don't like owning anything. No, you know, you know, look, we we used to have on the trading desk uh, the last day, expiration day, when we'd be short all of these options and when, in fact, they'd be trading at a 16th. That's the derivation of teenies, uh, you know, 16th or a steenth. Uh, and basically, it was always a discussion as to whether we would be short thousands and thousands of these and, you know, you know, got a hundred multiplier, so you're you're basically looking at uh, you know hundreds of thousands times these six and a quarter cents, and that adds up to real money. And we we often used to debate whether we just sit there and collect that money on the Friday afternoon, or whether we cover everything, be very thankful for having made you know dollars, and and not worry about the last sixteenth or the last eighth. So. Uh, I used to choke on it sometimes, but we would occasionally really just buy these back and uh, try to say that we were thankful enough for what we had made and that we didn't want to be pigs about it and let somebody else have the last 16th so that we wouldn't have this one untoward event that Mark referred to that all of a sudden could risk blowing you up. See, listeners, even Don at the end of the day, is a, is a net unit buyer, or at least a net unit closer. Oh, wow. <laughs> and God, did I used to... I, did this, I, I, 
Mark, I just looked at our skylight, and the sky just went black. Yes, I think pigs are flying overhead of my office right now as we speak. Now you got to realize I, I hear say- a bunch. Of, I hear a bunch of of of, uh, of bullfrogs. <laughs> I didn't say we did it all the time, and I guess I would draw a line when you look at just how far out of the money these things were. So. Uh, I, I must fess up that we did it on occasion. It was never a proud moment, but uh, I'll admit to it. Never, never be ashamed of uh, it taking winners off the doesn't take a lot of book. analysis to look at a time like July, where VIX is still relatively low. There's definitely some potential turmoil, and you can get cheap, cheap out of the money puts in SPX for a dollar that end up in the money. You know, not not X. They didn't now. They didn't. Um, they did not uh, expire in the money, but they touched in the money. Right. Which is all you need, for uh, at least for the most of the savvy people who don't sit there and hold to expiration. But again, I do want to uh, tip our hat here to the boys over at Futures Magazine. This is an article. That, for the article, we did discuss quite a bit today. It's called Stock Market Trends and the Volatility Premium. You can search for that title, or you can just go to futuresmag.com. You can find it there. We will also link to it in the show notes. So if you're listening to the show and you want to hear more, by all means, check out the article, and you could see for yourself all of the author's conclusions. And that is going to do it for this volatility viewpoint segment. And now we're going to roll right into a combo mailbag slash crystal ball segment. And now we take a look at the crystal ball. And welcome to the Crystal Ball slash listener mailbag for this episode. We're doing a combo segment because we do have a listener question that feeds right into our uh, our Crystal Ball prognostications, as it were. But we'll get to that in a few seconds. Don is getting his calculations ready as we speak. But we'll mix it up yet again and start off the way we normally do <laughs> with our discussion of what's coming ahead in the land of I suppose you can call it general vol or overall market volatility. So, Mr. Mr. Sebastian, Mr. Sebast, what do you see looming ahead in your crystal ball for the week to come? Well, I may have tipped my hat early in the show, but uh, early in the week, I am a huge buyer of premium here. Um, you know, until the VIX Co- cover your ears, it Don. Hold- cover your ears. I know, I know. Until the VIX proves it can hold, it can hold thirty and, and lower. Um, you know, I'm, I'm. Perfectly happy to own premium. Uh, you've been able to gamma scalp anything that you bought, and uh, and right here with the market having rallied and what to me looks like a volatility index that's not really buying into a lot of what's being being said. Um, I would be I would be a very interested uh, put buyer. An interesting play might be to buy puts on the SPX and puts on VXX or puts on um, on VIX itself leading into Tuesday's expiration as uh, that could be a really interesting way to trade kind of both have it both ways. It's kind of kind of an interesting little little tidbit trade that I, I think might be fun to put on. But uh, no. And in terms of euro, I, I as I said, again, whatever if Don says sold to me for next week, I would probably take it off his hands and uh, which is as we all know is, is Don's call signal sold to you. Uh, Don sold to you, Schlesinger. Um, <laughs> exactly. And uh, <laughs> but uh, but that's kind of what I'm looking at. I, I I I think basically we're figuring out that the U.S. economy is better than everybody thinks, but Europe is is a train wreck. So yeah, you know, and I agree. I, I'm not usually a uh, a a big premium buyer, but we've been I'm looking at our positions. We've been we've been ending up net long units in a lot of our positions now, just because that is the savvy way to go. And you're right. In this environment, you can gamma, gamma scalp and take away a lot of that risk of owning that long premium position right now. If, you, if you're a decent gamma scalp and you have the time to attend to your positions and actually do some of that active scalping. But uh, this is not a bad time. Like I said, Don, cover your ears. But it's not a bad time to be net long some units, particularly if you can gamma scalp it and you're savvy enough to do that. That does take a lot of the uh, a lot of the sting out of owning those positions. And given what we've seen in Europe, it may not be uh, you may be you may be happy in the long run that you have have those those units in your back pocket all right thank you for that mark and of course we mentioned that this is indeed a combo listener mail slash 
crystal ball segment. And the reason for that is we had a very interesting e- or email. Actually, we had a very interesting forum post on our website that ties right into a topic we've discussed quite a bit on this show. And we discuss every week, actually, here in the crystal ball segment. That is the outlook for the Eurovol. And, of course, also one of Don and, indeed, Volex's favorite things, which is the old tasty Vol cone. So let me just read that email. Or that, I'm sorry. Let me read that forum post here. It came from Simon. It was posted on our own options insider forum and i again encourage all of our listeners to surf on over there if they have any questions they'd like to have answered on the show and simon writes the title of his thread is where are we on the euro volcone and he writes i know the guys over at volex are big fans of the volcones and i can tell you simon from personal experience that that is indeed an understatement they love they love 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 their volcones <laughs> and he writes i'd like to know where the euro vol contracts currently fall on the Volcones spectrum. It sounds like there would be a screaming cell at these levels. Am I correct? And do the hosts agree? So, Don, this one has you written all over it, sir. So, by all means, take it away. Well, of course, we've discussed more than once that Volcones are purely historical in nature. They tell you what has happened and uh, what percentage of the time volatility for an underlying has either been below or above certain key numbers. And we always begin with the caveat that uh, past performance is not always indicative of future results. And we, we spoke about that earlier, whether there hasn't been some kind of a shift to an environment of volatility that uh, may persist uh, this way for a while. But with, with those warnings aside, the straightforward answer to the question is the one-month vol product, that's the December front month, settled last night at 16.56, even as the four days worth of volatility were that 18 that I discussed earlier. And the three-month uh, December uh, realized volatility uh, contract settled at 14.56. 94, which again is a relatively high number. Now, how high? Well, if we go back just to the past year and we take a look at vol cones, we find that for a one month product, the maximum one month volatility ever displayed for the entire period was 17.4 but that 90% of the time, one month volatility was below 13.97. And here we sit at 16.56 last night's settlement price. For the three month product going back a year, the maximum three month volatility ever displayed was 1406. That's a moving average, the, the highest ever recorded this past year, and we're, we're sitting at 14.94 last uh, night's settlement. And 90% of the time, three-month euro volatility was below 12.85. Now, that's using only a year's worth of data. Somebody might say, why don't you go back, you know, 20 years, use all the data you've got for the euro. Well, if you do that, turns out that 90% of the time, we have the same value for the one month, we're under 14. And 90% of the time for the three month, we're under 13.26. So you'd have to say that our listeners conclusion that this looks like a screaming cell certainly would be true if all you were considering were the findings from the Volcones. Exactly. Question question remains, is something else going on? And is this a dangerous period to rely on just the data from the Volcones alone? And so in this period of an unprecedented volatility and with everything that we've discussed about what's going on in Europe, then as much as we like this as an analytical tool, 
you, you'd have to say tread lightly and be careful because these don't appear to be normal times. No, I mean, we discussed earlier in the show and Mark brought it up with an interesting point that these are there are potential structural issues going on in the euro right now, which may render a lot of these numbers in the pure statistical analysis and volatility analysis of this somewhat moot because if the if there's a massive structural change, those cones may be thrown out of whack. So indeed, 99.99% of the time, those numbers agree. This is a screaming, screaming cell, and our listener is correct. But that 0.001% of the time, that small, small delta of a massive structural change may indeed be at pl- in play right now. So maybe if you are going to be looking at these vol cones as an indicator of sells or buys, or in this case, sale- sales, you maybe want to do it on a net neutral unit basis where you do a vertical as opposed to just naked outright sell, let's say, an upside call in uh, in euro vol right now. So just because you don't want to have that that chance we talked about earlier in the show about that very small probability of the vol going from 11 or 15, in this case, up to 70. And uh, it could certainly happen with given what we're seeing right now and all the turmoil we're seeing in the euro. So I, indeed, this is a screaming sell, but be wise, be cautious. Don't... Uh, don't get naked short any upside right here unless you're very, very confident and indeed a perhaps a braver man than I at that this point. Don, even you, degenerate premium seller that you are, would you be naked short units here to the upside in Eurovol right now? No, I'm out. And you know my old saying, two good things you ought to do with options, sell them or don't sell them. This looks like the don't sell them time. You heard it even from Don, the the president of the old degenerate premium selling club, <laughs> that uh, this is the time when maybe you want to uh, hold your hands back a little bit instead of hitting those bits. Just an interesting, an interesting email, an interesting uh, thing to ponder as we're looking at all the tumult over there in the land of Euro. So Simon, thank you for that that uh, that post in the in the discussion forum. Definitely interesting stuff to discuss because we always talk about Valcones on this show, but this may indeed be one of those times when the Valcone could be a wee bit misleading or indeed tempting. It's a siren, Don. It it tempts you onto the rocks of high volatility. <laughs> All right, and that is going to do it for the Crystal Ball slash listen, listener mail section of the show this week. It's also going to do it for the Volatility Views program. I want to thank all of my partners in crime for joining me on the show today, starting off with you, Mark Sebastian. Tell our listeners what is coming up in the land of Option Pit you want to let our listeners know about. You know, Don and I were joking earlier at the top of the show that we're, we're, bo- we're both excited and a little concerned that you and Bob are going to have uh, are going to have the reins next week and are going to deliver us a show. And uh, we're interested to see what, what, what turns in. You, you might actually even do some uh, do some man on the street type action over there at the Traders Expo. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm looking. I'm actually. Yeah, I'm going to send you all my files. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you know, Bob. I think Bob's a great guy, and I'm looking forward to to working with him. Bob uh, Volex, the Volatility Exchange, and uh, Option Pit, the uh, number one place for option education. Uh, we're both going to be at the Las Vegas Traders Expo. I'm going to be speaking on Friday at 3:30 and Saturday at 11:15. As well as um, I'm going to be giving a a mini pit report every day at uh, 10 o'clock uh, Vegas time. So there's going to be a lot of things going on. We're having a competition in our booth for uh, it's an option picking competition, and uh, everyone's going to be given five thousand dollars of play money to uh, to trade paper money, if you will. And uh, top prize is either a Kindle Fire. We're going to be the only people there that have one. I can guarantee you that much. Um, And a year's supply of coffee, a French press, and a coffee thing for for a second prize. Uh, Third prize, $500 worth of swag from Option Pit. And then uh, lots of other prizes for uh, the the other top ten that join. So uh, come and visit us at the pit and uh, see what we have to say. And... uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in Las Vegas. Um, my Friday presentation is going to be available online as well. And listeners, hand off, hands off that Kindle Fire because I've already claimed it f- from Mark. So I have dibs oh, there you on go. that Kindle Fire first. That, that's an interesting prize. I think you're probably one of the first people to be giving away a Kindle Fire, I'm sure. I, I, I would bet we are the first. We're having, it comes out on the 15th. It's being delivered to our hotel. And we haven't <laughs> even gotten our hands on it. Um, it, my, it just so happens my assistant knew someone at Amazon that could get us um, pushed up the list. So There you go. Uh, nice to have connections. Ethel Merman in, uh, in 
Sioux City, Iowa is going to have to wait one extra day for her Kindle Fire because we uh, we ordered ahead of her. We got pushed ahead of her. Full Merman, you say? Yep. <laughs> All right, Mr. Sebastian. We'll look forward to uh, to hearing hearing what you guys have to do or what you guys have coming out at the expo next week, and we encourage all of our listeners to swing out there to Las Vegas. The show is indeed free, and you can check out both what Mark is doing as well as what the Volex boys are doing over at the Traders Expo next week. So definitely check, stay tuned for those, and our listeners stay tuned for what Mark and Bob put together next week because it should be very interesting to say the least. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. And of course, Don, Mark did just say that they that he and Rob and the rest of the Volex gang are going to be out in the Traders Expo next week in Las Vegas. So I'd imagine that is the big up and coming thing coming up for Volex as well, unless there's some other interesting developments going on at Volex.us. Well, that's certainly uh, on the horizon for the coming week. Uh, I'll make one final announcement. We're still in the process of trying to uh, line up everyone and get the dates to correspond with their schedules. But we are actually in contact with uh, three uh, rather interesting and uh, prominent potential guests, uh, some of whose names are household words and and would be well known to our listeners. And we're going to try our best after next week in Las Vegas and perhaps uh, possibly taking a week for Thanksgiving to look back into December for the first three Fridays before the holidays and see if we can't line up these three guests whom I think uh, would be uh, terrific and lively debates and discussions to, to be had with them. So we'll try to crystallize all of that in the week or two to come and look forward to having them on the program. Sounds good. And of course, I encourage all of our listeners to follow Simon's lead and surf on over to the optionsinsider.com. Click on the old forum tab and then scroll on down to the listener questions for volatility views section where you could post your questions, comments and deep thoughts for us. And if they're interesting or timely, we will po- we will answer them here on the program. You can also find us on Twitter, twitter.com slash options or twitter.com slash volex underscore info. You can also find us on Facebook and all those other fun things. And the the hearty of you can even find us, leave us a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Keep it short, keep it intriguing, and we may even just play you on the air and immortalize you for all your friends and neighbors. <laughs> that is going to do it for the show this week. I'd like to thank all of you out there for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the program and, and making it such a hit. And we'll see you next time. Or I should I say, Bob and Mark will see you next time <laughs> right here on Volatility Views. Thank you for listening to Volatility Views. Join us next week as we keep our listeners on the cutting edge of finance and risk management with lively topics relating to volatility. Volatility Views is brought to you by the Volatility Exchange. If you'd like to learn more about vol contracts, please visit www.volx.us. If you'd like to submit a question for the hosts, then surf over to www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum and post your questions question in the Volatility Views Forum. Questions can also be submitted via email at questions at theoptionsinsider.com or via Twitter at twitter.com slash options and twitter.com slash volx underscore info. Facebook users can submit their feedback via the Options Insider and Volatility Exchange Facebook pages. Voicemails are also welcome at 312-544-9356. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Volatility Views. The views expressed on this program are not intended as investment advice and do not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities or other financial instruments and may not be relied upon in connection with the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instrument. The opinions presented on this program represent those of the speakers and do not reflect the views of either the Options Insider Incorporated or the Volex Group Corporation. The preceding program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. 